Father, we just thank you for your goodness in our lives. Just remember the words of Jeremiah where he says, Yet this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness never ceases. It's new every morning. God, we thank you that that's the kind of God that you are. Therefore, we have hope. We have hope in you. Jesus, we love you. God, I just want to pray as we remember some of our stories here today and over the next couple of months. I want to pray that this altar that we're building today um, praise and remembrance would be lit with the fire of your Holy Spirit. I want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you would light a fire in our hearts like you did with Jeremiah so long ago. He said, your, he said, your words in his heart were like a fire and he couldn't hold them in. God, would you ignite passion in our hearts? Would you open our eyes to see like you see? To dream your dream. Jesus, we desperately need your vision for this world. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Would you touch us in the way that only you can? Would you touch our eyes so that we can see? Touch our hearts so it burns with your passion. Love you, Jesus. So today we're beginning um, something that really God began in the week before our L retreat, our L team left on a retreat, where we had a time of prayer together as a community reflecting on Acts chapter 2. And God began to speak to us about our identity as a people and what it meant to be community and how we could be one anothering each other. And it goes back even further than that to um, a word that God gave us back at our fall kickoff out of Hebrews 11 and 12, where God was reminding us of the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us and how we in our generation get to take the torch from the last generation and run the race that's set before us with endurance. So I want to just begin this time by uh, reading together out of Hebrews 11. It goes this way. How much more do I need to say? And remember, this is the heroes of the faith. Okay, just putting it in context. Okay, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received back their loved ones again from the dead. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. You guys, God's dreams are always bigger than any one of us can do alone. In fact, they're even bigger than any one generation can do alone. What I love about Hebrews 11 is, is it paints the picture of generation after generation, person after person who said, in my day, I'll take the torch that you give me, God, and I'll run the race that you've set before me with everything in me. I will trust in you, and I will obey you, and I will not give up. This is really what defines us as a people of faith. God's been speaking to us a lot about our identity as a people. What does it mean to be first one of his children? What does it mean to be one of his disciples? What does it mean to be a YWAMer? 
We believe that God is wanting to ignite something in this season that really um, marks us of picking up the torch from the generation that ran before us and running the race that's set before us in our generation. When I was a, a little kid, I think I was 10 when this happened, there was a torch run that was going around the world. And some YWAMers had gathered in Jerusalem, and they gathered on Ascension Hill, the place where Jesus ascended into heaven, or it's believed he did. And there on that hill, they lit a torch, and they said this torch represents the words that Jesus gave his disciples right before he ascended to heaven. These, this torch represents the Great Commission. And our desire is to run this torch to every corner of the world. So they began to run with this torch, and um, one by one, they lit somebody else's torch, and the torch began to spread to the continents of the earth, and they kept running this torch over the course of several years in many countries. It covered over 40 countries and went over 50,000 miles, this torch going around the world and calling people into missions, and into Jesus' mission, which he originally lit there on that ascension hill. We're going to go back into history together for a moment and watch an old school video. In this world of darkness, May this the spark of evangelism at Mount of Ascension here today will spread and start fires and flames of evangelism in all parts of the world and may churches of the world be aflame for the kingdom aflame for the gospel and aflame for Christ let the church of the world unite in cooperative evangelization and bring the world to Christ and welcome back our King I commission this torch of the gospel be carried to all corners of the world in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go and preach the gospel. this video is that you weren't allowed to carry the torch unless you were a teenager or younger. The only people that could carry the torch were teens or younger. And it was representing that what Jesus began is meant to pass from generation to generation. And that we are youth with the mission. So if you're a teenager in this room, I affirm you. Man, you are not like a second class citizen. You are why this mission exists. And I believe that God is wanting to ignite the fire in our hearts to pick up that torch that he started 2,000 years ago and to say, Jesus, it's not done yet. Not everybody knows you yet. The nations don't look like you yet. Man, the Nicaraguan court system doesn't reflect your ways. What I'd like us to do is we're going to take a moment to remember our own stories. Okay? And I want you to turn to a, a person next to you, one or two people next to you, uh, maybe move around. Let's move around a little bit, okay? Some, some people that aren't next to you. Can we get in groups of three and remember our own missions stories? How did Jesus light this fire for missions in our lives? Okay. We're going to come back together. So there's a lot of power in story and in sharing stories. And at, at our leadership team retreat, that was one of the things that God began to remind us of, is that one of the ways we get our identity as a people, and particularly we as a people here are a people group of YWAMers, the way we get our identity is through sharing the stories of what God has done with us. And so at our leadership team retreat, we took some time to watch a message from David Hamilton that goes through four key stories in our history, and what God invested in us as a mission 
what torch he lit among us as a mission when those stories were shared, and how those are significant to our identity and one of the things that needs to be passed as a legacy generation by generation. Uh, There's a passage in Deuteronomy 5. Michelle, can you pull up that passage? A passage in Deuteronomy 5 um, where actually the, the whole book of Deuteronomy, I found this fascinating, is actually like one message from Moses to the people. It's like his last message, and then he goes up on the mountain. Okay, so it's a, a long message. We're only going to read four little verses. Okay, so then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. So the interesting thing about this this passage is this is Moses' last speech, and the people that he's talking to, actually none of them were alive when God gave this message originally to their forefathers. When God had Moses go up on the mountain and inscribe the Ten Commandments, that whole generation rebelled against God and they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. And none of them were actually standing there when he gives this message on that day. What we can take from this this passage is that when God makes a promise, he takes it and fulfills it generation by generation with those who are willing to pick up the covenant and say, I'll run with it and be faithful in my generation. So the only people that were actually present uh, when he originally gave that covenant that were alive when Moses says this to them at this point is Joshua and Caleb. Because there were two people who said, you know what, there may be giants in the land, but we can take them anyway. Okay? So why is this significant? Well, none of us were there in 1956. Most of us were not alive. If you were not alive in 1956, raise your hand. Okay, most of us were not alive in 1956. Uh, None of us were present in this tiny little room in the Bahamas when God gave Lauren this vision as a 20-year-old of waves of young people. We weren't present. And yet, in a sense, we were. Because God, as he makes a covenant, he makes it generation to generation to all who say, I'll pick up the torch and run with it. And we're entered into that family of those who run with the torch. We're going to watch a short clip here um, from Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs uh, about the significance of story to identity. Second is the us of identity. Let me give you a thought experiment. Have you been to Washington? Have you seen the memorials? Absolutely fascinating. There's the Lincoln Memorial. Gettysburg Address on one side, second inaugural on the other. You go to the Jefferson Memorial, screeds of text. Martin Luther King Memorial, more than a dozen quotes from his speeches. I didn't realize in America you read memorials. (laughs) Now go to the equivalent in London in Parliament Square and you will see that the monument to David Lloyd George contains three words. David Lloyd George. (laughs) Nelson Mandela gets two, Churchill gets just one, Churchill. (laughs) Why the difference? I'll tell you why the difference. Because America was from the outset a nation of wave after wave of immigrants, so it had to create an identity, which it did by telling a story which you learned at school, you read on memorials, and you heard repeated in presidential inaugural addresses. Britain, until recently, wasn't a nation of immigrants, so it could take identity for granted. The trouble is now. The two things have happened, which shouldn't have happened together. The first thing is, in the West, we've stopped telling the story of who we are and why, even in America. And at the same time, immigration is higher than it's ever been before. So when you tell the story and your identity is strong, you can welcome the stranger. But when you stop telling the story, your identity gets weak and you feel threatened by the stranger. And that's bad. I tell you, Jews have been 
scattered and dispersed and exiled for 2,000 years, we never lost our identity. Why? Because at least once a year, on the festival of Passover, we told our story and we taught it to our children, and we ate the unleavened bread of affliction and tasted the bitter herbs of slavery. So we never lost our identity. I think collectively, we've got to get back to telling our story: who we are, where we came from, what ideals by which we live. And if that happens, we are, will become strong enough to welcome the stranger and say, "Come, and share our lives, share our stories, share our aspirations and dreams." The us of identity. So our sense is that God is wanting to establish our identity as a people,、uh, and that the way that He's wanting to do this with us. Is for us to take some time to intentionally reflect on these four key stories from our history, four key moments where God met us and gave us something that was way bigger than one generation could ever do alone. Okay, these four stories, Michelle, can we pull up the next slide?、Uh, these four stories、um, are、uh, the vision of the waves, the spheres of society, the Christian Magna Carta, and end Bible poverty. So, what we're going to be doing over the next four staff meetings. Is we're going to take a staff meeting.、Uh, each of our next four staff meetings, we're going to take the first hour to first hear the story, and it's and、uh, the verses that go along with it, how it ties in with God's bigger story. Then to take time to wait on God together. What does it mean for us? What are the implications for us as a community? And we feel like this specifically has to do with vision.、Uh, one of the passages that、um, that. Celso got in one of our prayer times was out of Mark eight, where Jesus heals a blind man, and he heals the blind man by first spitting in his eyes, <laughs> and then he puts his hand on his eyes and he prays for him and he says, "Now what do you see?" And he says, "I see the people walking like trees."、And、Jesus says, "Okay, let me pray for you again."、And、he prays for him again, and then Jesus can see the man can see clearly the people walking. We feel like God is wanting to touch our eyes so that we see as He sees. So we're going to be doing this over the next four staff meetings, and、uh, this is not just for the staff. We、um, are inviting the students, all of you DTS students, to come. We actually would long for you to be there,、uh, if it's at all possible. Okay. So these are the dates,、uh, and it's from three to four. It's the first hour of our staff meeting,、um, but we believe,、um, just as the young people carried the torch, that there are things that God wants to speak to you guys that will inform our community. How we move forward. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this? Okay. We're going to end with the passage from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and it's different version, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the Author and Perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can we go back to verse one? So, what we would like to do, just for a moment here, is just to begin to prepare our hearts for this journey. Okay, and we won't finish it in this moment, but we're going to begin. The process. We're just going to do a check-in with God. Hey God, how's my heart? Is my heart ready for this journey? Is there anything that I need to get right with you so that when we come together on Thursday for this first time, we're all ready to hear? And it's like we've tilled the ground and we're just ready for everything He has to sow into us. Okay, so we're going to take a moment for a heart check.、Uh, while we're doing a heart check, I'm going to invite you guys to come back up, and we'll go back into a little bit of worship after this. So God, we thank you that you are a God that is from everlasting to everlasting. That you were there with Abraham and with David and with Jesus, and you're here with us. So God, we thank you that you carry your covenant and your dreams from generation to generation. And so God, we just bring you our hearts here today, and we just ask that you'd search our hearts. God, if there's anything that we need to set aside, if there's something that we need to to fast over the next few weeks, if there's something we need to get right with you or somebody else, our hearts are here. We just want you to search us, Jesus.